Hello, I'm Scott Patrick at the Dish Studio. Ready to go on a Disney ride of a lifetime without having to leave your television room? Well, thanks to History Channel, you can watch a new six-part nonfiction series called How Disney Built America. And one of the people who really helped Disney change the land and the world, uh, Disneyland and Disney World, is Disney Imagineer Bob Gurr, who just turned 92 years old and as you're about to see, he still has the heart and soul of a kid going to Disneyland for the very first time. Now, among his 100 plus creations, uh, the Disney monorail to the Haunted Mansion. I got the chance to sit down and Zoom with Bob, but first, let's see a preview about Walt. Walt Disney in the new series, How Disney Built America. Walt was relentless. Once he had that vision in his head, there was no stopping him. Looks like, uh, Mickey. Just the black outline of those ears are recognized all around the world. The multi-plane camera, synchronized sound, Technicolor, it all comes together for the first time. Disney's legacy continues to echo through the American culture. How Disney Built America. New series premieres Sunday, April 28th at 10, only on the History Channel. All right, Bob, welcome to Dish and the Dish Studio. What a blessing to speak with you. Uh, Take us back in time and uh, take us to uh, the uh, land uh, that you landed in with uh, Disney. Well, I had, you know, I went Art Center College of Design to be a car designer. I went to Detroit, came back here because I was born here. And for a year and a half, I didn't do anything. And then a phone call to go to the Disney studio. In about 20 minutes, I arrived there in October of 1954 and stayed for 27 years. Wow, amazing. Looking at your Instagram post, a few weeks after starting with Disney, there are a group of you huddled, and then some uh, old guy comes walking up, tells that story. Oh, well, this was Saturday morning, the first Saturday morning. I came back with some sketches. And the uh, little chassis of this car, which didn't have a body on it, was out in the back lot of the studio. As you know, guys will talk about cars. They put their foot on a tire, and then they put their elbow on their knee, and then they cogitate uh, the mechanicals of the car. And we had a spare wheel available, and a fellow walks up, an well, older guy. I kind of took him as uh, father one of the night guards. And uh, conversation, you know, for quite a few minutes. And then when he walked away, uh, everybody said, uh, see you, Walt. And I thought, that was Walt? Disney? I don't know what he looks like. So the following week, I did come back with more drawings uh, because I still had a regular job that I, I was working at as a temp anyway. So the second week, Walt was there, and he starts asking me about the books I've written. And it puzzled me. How did he know I write books? Well, it, it caught on shortly. Um, Backing up a few years, when I was 19 years old, I wrote uh, the first of several books. And apparently the fellas that uh, Walt was searching for finding somebody as a body designer, you know, he never puts an ad in the paper. There were two guys at the studio that were car guys, uh, Ben Sharpstein, a producer, and uh, Ward Kimball, uh, a crazy animator. I was friends of both those guys uh, years before. So... Uh, put two and two together. Oh, Walt asks around the studio, anybody know, anybody put a body on this little car? And they said, yeah, call Bob Gurr. He does work for Post Publications and we're friends at Post Publications. Just like that. Walt wants nearly $5 million to build his park. A family amusement park that will cost about three times what Snow White cost. That's how insane this idea is. It's huge, this is big money. And who knows how it's going to work? We tend to think of studio entertainment and outdoor amusements as being part of the same enterprise. There was no connecting tissue like this in Walt's lifetime. This idea couldn't be further from the center of Walt Disney Productions. I don't want this company to stand still. We have prospered before when we have taken chances and tried new things. This is our golden opportunity to move into an entirely new field. Walt, we're a film studio, not a carnival. The answer is no. 
Most people would have walked away, but Walt was always different. The real pixie dust was an imagination of a person who's really curious. Well, the uh, show on a is called uh, How Disney Built America. I want to uh, give it a new title, How uh, How You Built Disney. I mean... <laughs> Whoa, no, no, no I, I only just a little bit part of it, yeah. <laughs> a big part of that, though, I think 100 uh, projects over the years. Uh, tell us about some of them. Uh, and I've been on some of them. Uh, and again, back to being a blessing, my childhood going to Disneyland and Disney World when it opened and uh, uh, was on, you know, did that mono ride. I was like, I didn't want to get off. It was so cool. Oh. Uh, well, basically, the easiest way to describe Disneyland being built, treat Walt as he's got a music score and he's got the stick in his hand and he's trying to find people who can play different instruments. Okay, this means you have set designers, electrical people, the storyboard people, costume people, and oh, by the way, they need a car guy. So uh, I'm sort of the car guy in the orchestra. The way he would work, he didn't go around and give orders. He would get a conversation started like, well, we're thinking of doing this or we're thinking of doing that. And in my case, virtually every job was a, a very startling in, in hindsight. He would come to where my board and look at something and he says, say, hey, Bobby, we don't have this. We're thinking of doing this. And, uh, and then he'd say, you know, about what it is. And then he says, uh, oh, by the way, we have to, we got a parking lot and we got to get people from the parking lot to the, um, to the ticket, the ticket booth. And he says, uh, we need a little, some kind of a little tram thing. What can you come up with? <laughs> oh, gee, I thought you'd buy them. No, he wanted to make one. So I make a little model of it and he and I get down on the floor and we pull it around and yeah, it's a, you know, four car, three, three four car train. Yeah, it'll, it'll track in a parking lot. So I get started on that one. And the next thing he wants, he says, maybe the little kids might like to ride in a little tiny Autopia bus. So he has me start making a drawing. And he figures out, well, that's probably not very practical. And then, of course, by the time we get to um, end of the year, we're looking at 1956. And he says, uh, you know, we need antique cars on Main Street. And so he's got a guy who wants to sell him a bunch and restore him. I said, no, that won't work. Well, what are we going to do to have antique cars? I said, well, well, we'll design from scratch a brand new antique car. Oh, really? Can you do that? <laughs> All of this just zipping one after another pretty soon. No, he needs a train. Pretty soon he needs another train. And then within five years, he says, oh, Bobby, we found our monorail company. And here's pictures of it. It's not very good looking, so I'd like you to get started on ours right away. And he walks out of the room. No further instruction. He did that to everybody. He figured if somebody was bright enough, they'll figure something out just from the, the starting words or a starting sketch or a storyboard or something. So I didn't realize um, until many years later, this is not the way industry does anything, but it's the way Walt gets stuff done. Absolutely. So one day he comes up and goes, Bob, uh, we don't have a haunted mansion. Uh, can you help me out with that? Uh, what about uh, Matterhorn uh, Botsicle? Uh, can you help me out with that? Well, during the 12 years that he was uh, there while I, you know, the years I was there, um, what, how I told you how he does stuff is exactly the same thing he did to, with everything. Now stop and think of the wisdom of this and the risk. He has people who are not afraid of a white piece of paper. And if Walt says, I want you to get started and walks away, do you know what he just did? He gave you a magnificent amount of trust in your judgment to do something to fit the rest of the park that it's going to operate in. And the good part is I get to do it the way I want from the get-go because I have the pencil and I have the paper and in the case of the monorail, within a few days, I had a sketch. I, I made it in my kitchen table at home. I could see the shapes that we need to make that train look right uh, much better than what would be a standard train. 
and with another day or two, I make a, a drawing of it. And then Walt comes back and looks at it with a color on it. And he just simply says, Bobby, can you build that? And he looks at my boss and I look at my boss and I say, yeah, man, sure, we can build that. And he walks away again. And that leaves it to my boss who's in charge of all of the equipment for the park. Uh, and, and we take off and do everything that we need to do. Amazing. What's the favorite thing that you created there? The favorite thing I created at Disney? It has to be the little fire engine on Main Street. That little fire engine is important. And I'll, I'll tell you why. A couple of years before I went over to Disney, Ward Kimball had a 1916 American or France fire engine. And he asked me to come down and drive it in a parade. Okay, wow. now you take a 21-year-old and you let him drive an antique American fire engine. Wow, you always want one the rest of your life, but you know you'll never be rich enough to ever have such a thing. But one day he was in my office and I suddenly said, well, you know, we don't have a fire engine on Main Street anymore because we had a horse-drawn one. It was not practical. And he says something like, well, oh, Bobby, yeah, we don't. About 20 minutes later, the accounting department phones up and say, Walt was just here. Would you please write this number down? It's the authorization for the new fire engine project. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get a fire engine. <laughs> just as simple as that. What a great story. Amazing. Uh, and you're doing a TV show. And you had uh, Sid Croft on recently and great conversation there. Sid Croft, oh my God, you're still here? And then we no, they the said, right are you still alive? Yeah. yeah. Well, in the case of Sid Croft, my manager picks out the people that uh, might enjoy uh, having me uh, in the show and ask them a lot of questions. And of course, Sid, is t he's 94, I'm only 92. So mm -hmm. we kind of joke, uh, we both said, oh, you still here? <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. And you're still traveling everywhere and having shows and signing autographs and meeting people. What does that mean to you when people come up to you and say, you changed my childhood, you changed my life, my visit there changed the way I looked at the world? This is, um, it's a very emotional thing. I get this a lot. I would say one of the most typical ones that a fellow will come up to me uh, at a public event, and they might uh, be a little bit of gray hair on the side and he's and he's got his children with him and the grandchildren and the guy is starting to have tears and he says oh bob i have looked for you forever to thank you when i was about five years old they let me ride on the nose of the monorail and i never got over it and that uh, that kind of stops me and that happens a lot very consistent somebody's family had a really, really outstanding day. And it's so, it's such an imprint in their mind. And then the fact that they said, Bob, you're a monorail. It's quite a sobering thing. Absolutely. Well, as I was saying earlier, when we were starting, the monorail was the first thing I rode and I truly did not want to get off. I was just jaw dropped, like, oh my gosh, I'm in the future. And uh, <laughs> it felt so cool as a kid. So Thank you for that. And it really loved, did have a big I impact on my life. I love to so, hear even you say that. <laughs> it talks about how Disney built America. What the what is the impact on America that Disney has had? Well, like here is saying, uh, at the time of designing and building Disneyland, uh, none of us really had any idea that it, it might uh, succeed. You know, it's a big job. It's risky. And a lot of naysayers said, oh, Walt's crazy. This will never work. But about Christmas time of 55, there were people coming back in droves. So yes, this is a gigantic piece of America and a gigantic industry worldwide that literally came out of the mind of a Mickey Mouse cartoonist. Awesome. Well, yeah. I appreciate your time. Really great to meet you. And uh, right. again, thank you for all the great memories you've given me and other people. Uh, around the world. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you so very, very much. Bye. Our thanks to Bob and all of our friends at the History Channel. Catch the new six-part nonfiction series, How Disney Built America, on the History Channel. That's Channel 120 on DISH. I'm Scott Patrick.